Thank you, Chad. Take your seats. I'll be here all evening. It's okay. Actually, can everybody hear me without the microphone? No. <laughs> How about that? Good evening. Thank you, Chad. It was a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Dean Rutherford, for having me here as a guest tonight. And uh, my stay in Little Rock has been fantastic. Uh, I've really enjoyed it here. I had an opportunity to visit uh, Little Rock Air Force Base today and uh, sign books out there. Uh, all my experiences everywhere I go, it, it, visiting military bases and talking with uh, different people in the military is always, for me, a richly rewarding experience, even if some of the people are in the Navy or the Air Force or the uh, Army. We, I forgive them those, those uh, digressions, but um, it, it's a real honor to be here tonight. Um, I get to speak fairly often, I think, and I don't usually get to speak in institutions of higher learning because I barely got out of the one I attended. And, and some people would say that the University of Miami was not an institution of higher learning. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, I'm muddled through. And, and it is funny that it, school doesn't define who you are or, or the school you attend. It doesn't make you a better person or, or a more intelligent person necessarily. It's, it's what you do with those gifts that you have innately that determines who you are and, and how you use them determines what you're going to do and who you'll become in life. But I think it's, it's, it's an exceptional opportunity for me to be here tonight and, and speak to a group of people who have dedicated their lives or are about to dedicate their lives to public service. So I'm not going to stand here and, and, and proselytize tonight about the importance of it, because obviously you get it. You, you understand the importance of public service and what it means, or, or you wouldn't be sitting here in these seats, except I'm sure that there are some of you here tonight who aren't students. and, and you know, got suckered into a Wednesday night at the Clinton School listening to me. You know, when, you, when you follow up secretaries of state and foreign heads of state, and I've even, I'm probably unique here in that I might be the only speaker who's had a relative here as a speaker, and your initials aren't William Jefferson Clinton, but uh, my cousin Dan Glickman was actually a, a speaker here about a year and a half ago. So I think it's a new precedent here at the Clinton School. So, you know, when you follow up people like that, it, it, you know, you realize it must be a slow Wednesday night in Little Rock. <laughs> but, um, but as I said, let, let me just reiterate quickly that I am very happy to be here. So let's talk about some of these issues that are facing our veterans today. All people who have made a sacrifice, who have decided to live a life of public service for however short a period of time that is. It may be a, a, just their four-year commitment, or it may be a 40-year career, a, as some generals and, and senior enlisted have managed to, to uh, perform. And, you know, whether they find that that is just a nice way of life with a steady paycheck or not, the fact is they've still committed themselves and committed their lives to service of their country. Unfortunately, what happens when you do make that commitment is at some point in your career, you are going to serve in combat somewhere in the world, or you will be deployed to a combat region in somewhere in the world. And when that happens, you see and do things that people should never have to see and do. As a result of that, people suffer not only physical injuries in, in combat, but what, what is such an insidious and, uh, and, and sometimes transparent injury is the mental injuries and the psychological injuries that people suffer. And that is something to which I've now dedicated myself uh, to bringing awareness is uh, the PTSD and the traumatic brain injury and, and making sure that these veterans who have suffered this invisible uh, injury, and because that's what it is, PTSD is not so much a disease as it is a psychological injury, that they will not go unnoticed, that they will not go without the care and the treatment that they deserve. This has uh, become my cause celeb, that veterans who have suffered from a psychological injury are going to receive 
the care and the, and the help they need. Let me get the boring part out of the way real quickly, the statistics. Earlier this year, the Rand Corporation came out with a study, and the study released showed that over 300,000 of our veterans who have deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan in support of the war on terror have suffered some sort of psychological injury. That might be a conservative estimate when you consider there are studies out there that show as many as 40 percent. And when, they, when their study came out, that was at that time 1.6 million troops had deployed. So you can do the math, 300,000 is, is a very conservative estimate. 30 to 40,000 of our veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan have been treated at VA hospitals for substance abuse. The, the, the mental health system, the, the medical system in the military and in the VA hospitals is just overwhelmed right now. They cannot handle the, the number of patients who are coming in with problems. Our legislators aren't funding appropriately mental health awareness or mental health care for our veterans. Uh, a physician in the military gets a bonus every year to try to create some sort of parity between the physician and his civilian counterpart. A, a psychologist with a PhD does not get that bonus. And, and oftentimes the psychologist with the PhD is far more qualified to handle some of the issues that we see with the, with the uh, PTSD and, and TBI and, and, and the issues attendant to, to these injuries. But yet they don't get that bonus, so there's no financial incentive for them to come in and, and, and join the service and deploy and be there where these guys and gals need the help the most. We have at this time approximately 154,000 homeless veterans in our country. It's not because they're lazy and don't want to work. There are more homeless Vietnam veterans right now than there were soldiers, Marines, airmen, sailors killed in the Vietnam War. There were 58,000, for any of you who are too young to remember that war, 58,000 killed during the Vietnam War. There are more than 58,000 veterans of Vietnam homeless in our streets today. It's in large part due to the problems attendant to PTSD, to mental health issues that went either unrecognized and or untreated because it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't chic to get help. And it's still not. So this is a big problem in the military. Anyone in the military will tell you that we are very, very reluctant to seeking help for anything. You know, it's our job to help other people. We take care of other people. When somebody else has a problem or a need, we're there to fix it. A big uh, misconception about the military is that we're all automatons that we're robotic killers and we can do nothing more than go into other countries and kill people and come home. But that's not the truth. People in the military are some of the most giving, generous, charitable people that you will ever know. We, we aren't all jut-browed knuckle-draggers who, who can't read and write. I mean, obviously I couldn't write. I don't claim to be able to read, but I can write. And and so we, we help other people. I mean, the Marine Corps and, and the other services are quite often involved in uh, non-combatant evacuation operations, humanitarian assistance operations, emergency relief operations from tsunamis and hurricanes. And any time you look at where we've had a, a natural disaster in our country now, the National Guard is there. They're, they're, they're on the front lines. Of, of all the hurricanes helping to evacuate people, to, to maintain order in these towns, and then to bring the people back and help them resettle in their homes. So the military is, is a lot about giving and helping, and not so much about asking for help for ourselves, but that's exactly what needs to happen. For far too long, the, the issues with uh, PTSD and, and mental health issues, and, and anything where you ask for help in the military has been stigmatized, and it's been considered a sign of weakness. So 
guys and gals won't go and get the help they need. So what happens? They have marital problems. And, and let me tell you right up front that PTSD affects the spouses and the families as much as, if not more than, it affects the person suffering from it. Because it, you can see it as, as a spouse. You can see the change in the person, but the person can't see the change in themselves, so they don't get the help. And so it, it's not just the, the veteran who's affected, it's the entire family, it's the community. And when we have 154,000 homeless people, because they have marital problems, because they have financial problems, they don't understand how to take care of their finances. They can't get a job because they can't play well with others. And now they're out on the streets. And so this is gonna become America's problem. This isn't just a problem for the Department of Defense or for the Army or the Marine Corps individually. This is a problem for the United States of America. Consider also that a number of veterans are gonna leave the military without ever having gotten two minutes of help and they're gonna become police officers and they're gonna carry guns and they're gonna become lawyers and they're gonna become doctors and mistakes are gonna be made because they're not thinking properly and they should have gotten the help, but they didn't because for so long it's been stigmatized that if you admit to needing help, then you are a weakling and we don't want you around. The Marine Corps, for one, has taken, I would say, drastic steps to ensure that this does not happen anymore. The Commandant of the Marine Corps has come out and said, he, he's established policy that nobody will be denied help, that nobody will be ostracized. The Marine Corps has established a combat and operational stress control program and ran a conference in San Diego on this back in August. And I, I was fortunate enough to attend and, and be part of a panel. So it, it, we're making strides in the right direction and things are going in the right direction, but more can be done. The government can do more for, for our veterans. It can always do more. We have veterans and their families. We have active duty military and their families who are living below the poverty line because young guys, Lance Corporals, aren't paid enough money to support a family. They're living on food stamps. So the government can do more. We can all do more. There's, there are any number of things that each and every one of you in this room can do to help veterans without actively counseling them, you, you can just be friends with somebody. Just treat them with respect the same way you would any of your other neighbors. So I wrote this book, From Baghdad to America, as a follow-up, I guess, was the original idea to my first book. And the first book details my time in Iraq and the Battle of Fallujah and how we found this five-week-old dog in the battle and then the, the trials and tribulations of finally trying to get him out of Iraq into America. And the book did really phenomenally well for a first time unknown author. And I was invited to attend a big book festival in Brazil because it became the number two bestseller there. And while I was there, my agent called and said, you know, a publisher wants you to write a second book. They want it to be a follow-up about life after coming home with lava and what it's been like. So I wasn't really too keen on writing another book that would be categorized as a pet book. And you know, I, I started writing this thing, and, and the reason I did it was she said, well, they'll pay you, and I thought, that's nice. And, <laughs> and, um, and I didn't have to write a proposal. Right? Getting a book published is not an easy thing, so anybody who's, who's done that you know, is, is to be congratulated because it's very difficult getting a publisher to buy your book and then to pu actually publish it. So the, the, the nice thing was I wouldn't have to go through that hassle. They, they already knew what they wanted. And I don't think I exactly wrote what they wanted because it's not a nice, fuzzy follow-up story to bringing lava home and we're frolicking in the waves and running on the beach and you know just having this wonderful Southern California life. I mean, we do, but that's not what the book's about. As I started writing it and, and looking at lava and realizing that this dog has some serious issues, I realized, well, if there's something going on with the dog, then there's probably something going on with me as well. And as I traveled down 
this, this road and, and began this journey of, of uh, introspection and, um, and, and trying to see what exactly my issues were, it became very important to me that I, I look at all veterans and, and anybody who's had multiple deployments to a combat zone or, or been in combat and, and see what exactly was going on with them. And when you look at it and you start studying about it to, to write a book about the issues that veterans are facing, it becomes frightening. It's, it's a really sobering thing. And I decided that I needed to bring this attention to the public because we've lost our focus on what's happening in Iraq and what's happening in Afghanistan. And I don't, I, I don't blame anybody for that. I mean, you know, well, first of all, our, our media cycle is about three minutes, and, and then the average person takes about 30 seconds of that into the next day. So our news is sound bites and it's clips, and, I'm, and I don't mean to belittle anything that's happening in our country right now. I mean, you know, our, our financial markets are sliding, and, you know, personally, I don't think it's anything that we need to jump off, off a cliff over because it's, it's a market that's correcting itself and going through a cycle, as all things do. But we have companies that were bailing out. You know, we're spending billions upon billions of dollars to rescue these companies. We have natural disasters galore hitting, hitting our shores. So there's plenty happening right here that people are aware of and that affect them personally on, on a daily basis. Yet what's happening overseas certainly isn't unimportant. We have young, young, young American men and women in uniform fighting for us. And regardless of your political leanings, you've really got to realize that they are fighting for our way of life. Because there are forces out there who are hell-bent on destroying our way of life and, and will do anything they can to see each and every woman in here covered head to toe, to see all the men in here with beards, to see none of the women driving. I mean, they, they want to destroy our way of life. And until they do that, and until they create this worldwide radical Islamic state, we're going to be in a war, whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan or even Pakistan, we're going to be in a war. So I, I realized how important it was to bring back to the forefront this issue that's confronting so many of our servicemen and women today and, and people who have left the military. For them, it might be even more important because it's very, very difficult for them to find the help that they so desperately need. And as I was writing the book, my publisher, my editor said, well, you have to go to therapy. And I'm a Marine. And I said, I don't go to therapy. You know, we don't believe in it. What is, what is this therapy thing? And, and she said, no, you have to go so that you can write about it firsthand and discuss it and that other veterans will be able to see from your experience that it's OK. And I said, no, I don't go to therapy. And she said, well, we don't publish your book. And, um, and I was running on deadline. They wanted this thing done in about two months. And so I took a month and, and I thought about it. I wrote other parts of the book. And I had to really think long and hard about doing this because I did not want to be in the system. And um, about a m month after this call, I, I, I relented. And I said, OK, I'll go. And, and I write about it in the book, about my experience. And, and I try to bring some levity to a very, very serious uh, uh, dilemma that faces so many of our veterans, many of whom don't even realize that they are suffering from PTSD or, or, or some other form of traumatic brain injury or psychological injury. They, they don't even know it. I cannot go outside in daylight without sunglasses. Whether it's sunny or cloudy, I can't do it because I have a problem from when an RPG exploded on a wall right there, that close to me. So I can't be outside without sunglasses during daylight hours now. I have a light sensitivity. But there are other veterans who are suffering so many more things from something similar to that, and they don't know it. So I went, and uh, wouldn't you know it always comes around to you know something about your mother. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I, I just don't know what it is with these people. 
but there's always something about your mother that comes up. And I thought, you know, I'm here to talk about my issues as a veteran and, and what I've experienced and why I'm so angry with people and why at a dinner party I just want to strangle the woman sitting next to me when she's complaining that their wine cellar won't cool to the right temperature. And, 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 and people in, in this country are going on with their lives, as you should. But there's no skin in the game. People don't have, for the most part, a reason to keep the war right in front of them every day. They don't have a relative or, or, or a friend who's deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan in combat. And I think that part of the problem, and you all here have figured it out, obviously, is the public service aspect of it. You know, when you elect me president, I will bring back mandatory national service. And it doesn't have to be the military. You don't have to join the Army. You can join the Peace Corps, or you can join the Marine Corps. You can go to work for the National Park Service. But I think that we need to bring that back in, into this country. I think... <laughs> so when you write me in, it's Copeland with a K and one P. But we need that. We need people to have a sense of sacrifice. It's, it, it amazes me that you know, there, we've got people in this country who have never seen, this is the first time they're seeing financial hardships. And like I said, our, our stock market, the Dow is still pretty close to 11,000. I mean, it's like, it's like 10, 10, 7, 10, 6. We're, we're not in a crisis here. And this is the worst that some people have ever seen. You know, it could be a lot worse. This isn't a jump out of the window, depression is setting in kind of event. This is a market correction. People don't remember the, the fuel crisis, the gas crisis of, of the mid-70s when we sat in lines and, and, had, a, and had a wait for, for gas. You know, they, they don't remember the Vietnam War. We're, we're, it's a, we're a very young country, I, I think, even though you know, we, we signed our, we, our Constitution in, in 1776, and then, even then it wasn't, I don't think, ratified for some years later. But we're a very young nation, and, and so people haven't had, in, in a number of instances, to really sacrifice, at least not since Vietnam, when we had a draft. Um, I don't advocate, advocate bringing back a draft. I, I think that you've got to have a military of people who want to be there because going into combat is not fun. It's not like the movies. Um, it, you see and do things that are, are horrible and that you'll never forget. And you don't want to force people to do that. I, I want people there who want to be there. But I think it's important that we do bring back mandatory national service. and. and and everybody should have to have a sense of sacrifice for their country. You, you get that here. You're, you're here because public service is, is what you've chosen for, for your life calling. And I really believe there's nothing more commendable. Uh, I guess I could have held out and, and kept trying to get you know, a, a C-level position with a corporation somewhere. But what I'm doing now with Freedom Is Not Free, to me, is so much more satisfying. It, it really is important to me that I can be an advocate now for veterans and their families. We raise money for, for wounded and injured veterans and their families and the families of deceased veterans when they need to pay a mortgage bill, when they need money to travel to the funeral of their husband or brother or sister or mother. And there's nothing that I can do I don't think it's any greater. That for me, this is my calling now. You know, if you had told me when I was 18 years old in high school, getting ready to graduate and go play football in college, that I would one day be not only in the military but then become an advocate for veterans, yeah, you know, I would have told the person they were out of their absolutely out of their mind that there's no way that was going to happen. And lo and behold, here I am, 30 years later. And uh, that's exactly what I'm doing. And, and I can't think of anything that's more rewarding and, and gives me 
a greater opportunity to get to speak to people like you and, and pontificate and tell everybody exactly how it should be, world according to Jake Hopelman. But this PTSD issue, the psychological injuries, it's not going to go away. It, we're going to be dealing with this for a long, long time. And until we can find a way to get veterans to accept the help they need, and hopefully they will read my book and, and they'll say, well, if the Marine Lieutenant Colonel did it, I, I, I guess it's okay for me. And in fact, I, I had written a line in one of the chapters saying, well, I guess if Tony Soprano could suck it up and go to the couch, so can I. And hopefully there are a lot of young, young kids out there who will see that I did it and that it's okay and, and that it, it doesn't hurt. You know, you may not like your therapist, but they're, they're not there to be your best friend. They're there to help you. So it, it, to me, it's, 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 it's a calling what I do. It's a cause, and uh, I, I don't think I ever really want to do anything else. I would like to say thank you very much for listening to me tonight, for being here. You've been a, a great audience. You laughed appropriately. That was <laughs> very nice. And I believe that we're going to open this to questions and answers. Uh, Nikolai is going to moderate that, I believe. And again, thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Do you have time for some questions? If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you so everyone can hear you. Right here. Did you find out what was wrong with your mother? That's We don't have enough time for that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you really quickly. She's not talking to me now. I was in Atlanta a couple, a few weeks ago for the Decatur Book Festival. and. My, my parents live in Decatur. They live right on the main drag in Decatur. And she decided that she would have a party after my, I gave a talk there and then did a book signing. And she decided she would have a party after my event there. So I have not, uh, I guess, genuflected enough or in God knows how many languages she would like to hear me say thank you. But yeah, she's upset because I haven't thanked her adequately enough. So. You tell me. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel, I salute you for your service. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. I actually work for the VA hospital here. I'm a cardiologist, and I see many veterans who have PTSD and many other problems. And I was in Florida for 20 odd years, and I saw many homeless veterans. You are absolutely correct. But uh, the issue that I'm going to discuss with you, you mentioned that many people there, you generalized it there against our way of life. I, I have an issue with that statement. The perception in those countries, especially in the Muslim world, is actually the opposite. I was recently in India, which is not a Muslim country, mm. but has a large number of Muslims, and is a very pro-US country. But I heard uh, people in Pakistan and many of my colleagues here who are from that part of the world, they feel that we are out to get them. And the example they give it is, um, like Iraq had nothing to do with uh, what happened on 9-11, and many, many innocent civilians there, hundreds of thousands of them, lost their lives. Would you have any comments on that? Sure. I, first of all, thank you for, uh, for your comments on my service. But I don't think I generalized that. I, I didn't say all Muslims or all Muslim countries. What I said was that there are people, that there are fanatics, that there are these radical Islamists and, and you know, I'm going to be, we're not talking even Wahhabists. That's not, that's not the argument I make. The, the, the point I make is that there are people who would, like Al-Qaeda and, and members of the Taliban, who would want to do away with our way of life. That there are radical, fanatical 
Muslims who would want to do away with our way of life. I, I don't advocate the overthrow of the governments of India or Pakistan or any other Muslim country unless that country does mean to do us harm. And I guess, you know, the, the first, I guess it was the first or second iteration of the Bush Doctrine was of preemptive self-defense. And, you know, I, I think that to an extent we have to agree with that just a little bit to protect our way of life. I mean, you're right, Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. And, you know, we could get into a huge ideological, philosophical discussion tonight about why we went to Iraq and was it the right thing to do and it wasn't it. And I've said publicly many times that it was not the place to start this fight. I, you know, I, I believe we should have finished the fight in Afghanistan when we started there and, and dedicated $87 billion a year and, and the manpower and technology to that fight. But we didn't, so we're stuck with what we've got right now, and, and we have to fix it, and we have to make it work. So, yeah, it, it wasn't the place to go or the time to go there. Would we have ended up there eventually? I don't know. We may have, because that may have become, at some point, a safe haven for Al-Qaeda and, and Taliban. I don't know. But that's what we've got right now. So we have to make it right before we leave it alone. Bob, right there. Yeah. Thank you. You said there were some issues with your dog. Your dog had some issues. Would you share those with us? Oh, sure. <laughs> so what, what kind of got me looking at all this is that the dog it has been clinically diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, and there's there's a guy who I reference in my book who's written journals on dog behavior and dog training. And in one of them, he lists eight symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder in dogs. And Lava has five of them. So he's uh, hyper alert. He's hyper reactive. He's overprotective. Um, he has this unwarranted fear of waves crashing on the beach. He won't go anywhere near a, a, a heavy shore break at the ocean. He loves running on the beach, but to get him there, uh, he turns into a quaking, I mean, he, he clawing his nails on the pavement not to have to walk down toward the beach. Um, so yeah, the dog has some issues. Oh yeah. He barks at nothing and everything for no reason, any reason. Well, does your organization have a website that we could go and look at and get suggestions on how to help? Yes, it's freedomisnotfree.com. It is a 501c3, but somebody already owned .org, and we've been trying to buy it. I think they're in Switzerland, actually, that, that own the .org website. Um, you can go and write big checks, because that's how part of my compensation is based. No. Um, yeah, you know, we don't have chapters yet. The, it's been around for three years, and they recently fired the previous director and the gal who was doing development left, so I'm now the head cook and bottle washer at Freedom Is Not Free. And one of the things I, I have on the to-do list is get the website at, at a point where it's a lot better and, and more user-friendly than it is now, and eventually I'll have uh, a membership capture capability so people will be able to join Freedom Is Not Free just as they can some of these other organizations. But yeah, please visit the website. Annie. Thank you for your service. If the reality message that you have shared and you have committed to carry it throughout the country to help us to understand what happened to our volunteer army and many of them are members of families. In some families, it's the grandfather, his son, his daughter-in-law, and even his grandchild that have come back with this condition. How do you recommend that we in America can continue with volunteer armies to protect us? And if we can't get a volunteer army because we're stretched so thin now, 
how do you see our protection for the freedoms that we now enjoy? That's a lot to digest. Um, well, I think that we will continue to have a volunteer army and, and volunteer military in this country because I think there are enough people, like this gentleman sitting here this evening, who are so patriotic and have a, a sense of duty and obligation. And, and some people like me, the judge told me it was my only choice. But, um, <laughs> Who, who will continue to serve. And I don't foresee that as a problem. I, I think part of the problem is that we don't have enough money to bring more troops you know, on active duty and to recruit more. It has been a problem. There, there was a problem uh, a, a couple of years ago with recruiting efforts. Yeah, recruiting fell off, um, but it's coming back now. And actually, you know, there are more and more young people who I meet telling me that they want to join the military either right out of high school or after attending college and going to officer candidate school or, or attending one of the service academies. And to be honest, I mean, those are some of the best educations that you can get in this country is, is at the military academy or the naval or air force academies. So I don't think that we're going to have a problem with that. I think there will always be, I mean, there always has been from the Revolutionary War till today, people have volunteered and we've had a volunteer military who will protect our freedoms and our rights in this country. Bob, right here. It's coming. It's going to take a, take a second. Hi. I normally don't ask questions, but I, I'd like for you, to, if you would, to... How do you learn anything? Uh, <laughs> well, publicly, I don't, anyway. Um, I've really appreciated your comments, but we have some students here who are interested in the therapeutic effects of the animal-human bond, and uh, so they came to hear about that a little bit. So would you mind saying a little bit about that? Yeah, actually, you know, I have a cardiologist here who I think is probably as much an expert on that kind of thing as anybody in the room, and it's well known, well documented that animals do provide calm and comfort to people. Uh, it, it, it's been shown, to, if I'm correct, doctor, to lower blood pressure and, and, and stress levels among people. Just by petting a dog or a cat, you can lower your blood pressure. So with Lava and me, in our, in our specific case, you know, he, it was easier for me to talk to him than it was to talk to some people. And I think at times when I needed it, I could just look at him and it was like intuitively he somehow knew what was going on with me. I, I think animals, yeah, they have mid-double digit IQs, but I think that their instincts and their senses of things sometimes are far better than ours. And so that helped me at times to get through some days just to have lava there. Uh, I mean, you know, animals are used as therapy animals in hospitals all the time, and the Army has actually sent dogs to Iraq to tour the bases so that soldiers can get an opportunity to have that bond. They, they've realized how important that is. We have time for one more. It's in the red. Yes. for your service, sir. Um, being a military family, I'm a veteran. My husband's an Iraqi veteran and the injuries that he sustained over there and us going through a bureaucratic mess and trying to get him good care and he's fixing to be medically retired. I wonder what challenges you came across with the VA system or the military and I wonder what you might suggest to others here who might not be as close to it as maybe we are and what they can do to push their legislature, legis the legislatures and um, other people who need to get involved to get make sure that we've got good care for these guys coming home. Sure. Um, I, I, first of all, thank you both for your service. And I would say that I am, I've been very lucky with my VA. Uh, living in San Diego, the, the VA hospital is in La Jolla. And it's affiliated with the University of California at San Diego Medical School. So the physicians there are 
you know, they, they are teaching quality physicians affiliated with UCSD. And so they practice at the VA instead of at one of UCSD's other hospitals. So I, I have, you know, I, I don't think I could get better medical care. You know, it, it's, it's phenomenal, the, the, the care I get. And I, I don't know, maybe when I go in with, actually, it's not true. It's, it's not even rank dependent at a VA hospital. Everybody is Mr. or Ms. So-and-so. Your rank goes away when, once you start going to a VA. So I, I think it's just kind of hospital to hospital uh, dependent on the, the level of treatment you get. And I don't know what it's like at the VA hospital here. Um, yeah, I, I think that the system is just so overwhelmed right now, and I think the doctor can attest to that, that, that there are just so many people coming back needing assistance and, and going for the assistance more than in, in the past, that the system is a little bit overburdened. There's an organization called IAVA, the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America grassroots organization. Their founder spoke here before as well. His name is Paul Rykoff. And when you talk about changing legislation or, or, or having your voice heard by your legislators, they're a very good organization to get involved with. And I'm a member of IAVA. Um, I, you know, I think all Iraq and Afghanistan veterans should join. They have done just remarkable work on getting the new GI Bill pushed through. They worked with uh, Jim Webb on getting on, on that legislation. They're, they're working on veterans' health issues. You know, Paul has been very involved with the RAND Corporation in their last study. So, and, and he, I think Paul himself would tell you that, you know, it's closer to five or 600,000 veterans who have suffered some sort of psychological injury than the 300,000 that the RAND Corporation cites. So that's a, that's a wonderful organization if you want to look at uh, legislative issues. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Jay Coleman.